Pause menus are essential for offering a safe space away from your gameplay where your player can fiddle with options, take a break and quit the game. It's also a good clean example of a bunch of the simple UI changes that Godot 4 has over 3. Huge disclaimer, Godot 4 is only in alpha and it's not in feature freeze yet. This guide is subject to change in the future. Do check the comments to see if anyone's pointed out anything that's changed since the video has come out. But I do want as many people as possible getting used to the beautiful world of Godot 4, so let's dive into things. So I've got a 3D player character that I'm going to add this pause menu to. This effect does work in both 2D and 3D though. If you're in 2D, you'll just add it on top of a canvas layer, but in 3D by default, if you add a control node, it will get overlaid over the top of the screen. So let's go into a new scene that will be the base for our pause menu. We want a color rect, which we can select from other node on the left. The reason we have a color rect as our base is it's very easy to apply a shader to. If we set that to full screen, and then make it invisible, it'll be easier to work with the rest of the nodes we're adding to the scene. So now we've got our background, we can start to add the rest of the UI elements. We want a center container to centralize our pause menu on the screen. Also set that to full rect in the layout tab. And then we want a panel container. Panel containers are a relatively recent discovery of mine that I absolutely adore. They are a container that applies a panel behind all of its children, so it's a very easy way to make something that holds menu items but has a background to it, and you can customise that in theme settings. The centre container is going to try and shrink the panel container to be as small as possible, so it's quite important here that we set its minimum size so we can actually see what it is. I'm going to set it to have a width of 512 and a height of 256. And this is the first example we're going to see of the nice new default UI theme for Godot 4, which is most items don't have a blue tint anymore, they tend to have rounded edges, and they're also a little bit transparent, which is just a lovely, modern, crisp feeling to it. So now we can dive into our third container that we are adding, which is a margin container. The margin container is going to add padding to any of the sides we want by a certain number of pixels and it's nice to give a bit of space and breathing room to the panel we've got behind it. So with our margin container, we can go into theme overrides and we can see the width properties that it controls. And you can control the width on the right, left, top and bottom. I'm just going to apply 16 pixels of space to everything but the top. Now any children we add to that will be spaced accordingly. And we can add our final container, which is going to be a VBox container, which will sort all of its children vertically. And you can already see that it's got space around the edge where its children simply won't be able to go. Additionally, whenever you put four containers into a scene, you have one Connect 4. Diagonally. Pretty sneaky, sis. Well, that's a fun little bug. It turns out in Godot 4, with, there's a new tab at the top of the viewport, that with an extra large resolution size makes the inspector and scene unusable, which is a bit awkward, so I've decreased resolution just for this section while I'm covering something to do with labels and buttons. When the bug happened, I forgot to say you need to add a label, an H separator, and two buttons. So now we've added our label and button, we can set their text. If you go into label, we get this new tab at the top, which is the bit that was overflowing and causing problems but it is very helpful. <laughs> what it does is it lets you control the font size straight in the top of the viewport without having to create any font resources or anything like that. It's quite nice. So if I change the text of the label to pause, that's not how you spell pause. There we go. And you set the text size larger. That's just something you can do now. It's really nice. And over in locale under horizontal alignment, we can center that and we can go and set the text for our buttons as well. The first button, I just want that to be a resume button, and the second button can be quit. With expand size flags, you can just fill the space better, which is quite nice. And now let's change the name of those buttons, because we're going to need to access their names later on. We can have a resume button, and a quit button. And that's everything we need to set up the defaults for our menu. Just to make sure everything's okay, here's what the scene tree looks like if you're following along at home. 
and I'm now going to return to the usual UI size. So now we've got all the individual parts of our menu added, we can focus on the shader that's going to blur our background. We want to go back to our color rect, we can make that visible again by setting it back to white, and we can add a shader to it. If you go to the material tab, you can add a new shader material to the material property, and then within that shader material, you can add a new shader. And we get one of our lovely new Godot 4 features, which is the mode gets added by default. So it's guessed we're going to add a canvas item because we're adding a material to a UI element, which means we're not going to have to write some of the boilerplate stuff we have to write every time we used to write shaders. So let's create a new shader. I'm going to call it Blur. And if we open that up, we get our shader window at the bottom, and you can see it's added our canvas item and fragment function by default. So let's go ahead and add a few of our key variables. We want to control the blur applied to the screen and the brightness of the screen, because we want to animate those properties. So let's export them both as uniforms. There we go. So we've got our blur and we've got our brightness. And now what we want to do is we want to use our blur with the texture load function. And the texture load function is going to load our screen with a level of detail parameter. And that level of detail parameter will let us blur the image it's getting from the background. So in our fragment function, it lets us set the color of each pixel on our screen. So let's get the color built in and set it equal to the result of texture log and pass in the screen texture and the screen UV and our blur. And now the higher we change this blur parameter to, the more blurred our screen will be because that maps onto the level of detail we get from our texture. After that, we can apply our brightness and that will let us make our screen darker. So we want to multiply our red, green and blue channels by our brightness so that the lower the brightness is, the more dimmed our screen is. And with that, our effect is done. If we go over to the shader parameter at the moment, we can see our blur is set to zero and our brightness is set to zero. If we raise our brightness to one, it won't be dimmed at all. But if we set it down to 0 0.9, our screen will be 10% darker than normal, or 0 0.3, it will be 70% darker, and so on. And now with that shader all set up, we can focus on the actual animation for opening and closing the pause menu. So what we want to do here is add an animation player. And we can add a new animation. This can be our unpause one, which is what we want to default to. If you set it to autoplay, we can also set the length to zero and that will make it as short as possible. We want the process of shutting the menu when we unpause after it's open to be immediate, so we make it as short as possible. Now we can dive over to our color rect, which has the shader on it, and we can access its shader parameters from in our animation player, which is one of the really nice ways to interact with shaders because it exports the value in the inspector the same way it does if you export value in GD script. So to start with, let's set the blur to zero, so the effect is off, and let's set the brightness to one, so that it's at full brightness. And that's going to be our starting state. Separately from the background blurring and unblurring, it's also nice if we make the actual menu itself fade in. So if we go to the center container, we can control its modulate property, and we can make it default to be transparent. And that's all of the unpause function. We can now move over to the pause function where the actual animation happens. If you click duplicate in the animation tab over here, we can create a copy of what we've already got and rename it to pause. Now for this one, up the length to be 2.5 or however long you want it to be. Actually no, 2.5 is way too long, 0.3. And you can hold control and scroll in the mouse wheel to zoom in in the window down here. And if we move our playback point to the end of the track, we can duplicate all our values and then we can edit them in the window on the right. Let's duplicate the shader parameters and the modulate value. Now our modulate, if you click on that at the end of the track, we can click on the value in the key editor in the top right and we can just up the alpha value to our target. For our other properties, if you drag this little bit over here, it increases the amount of space we've got for the name of the property we're dealing with, so we can see which one we're handling. 
for the brightness, we want that to go down to 0 0.9 when it's open. I think that's about dark enough. And for the blur, we want that to go as large as possible, which is 2.5. If we then select all of the starting values for our track, we can set their easings, which is how quickly it will turn the first value into the second one. I like the out easing because it makes it quite quickly get towards its target value. And that's everything we need for our animation player. And now we can sink our teeth into the tasty, yummy, delicious GD script 2. Let's go to our root and add a new script. We want to get a hold of the three nodes that we're dealing with primarily here, which is the resume button, the quit button, and the animation player. When we're accessing those, we're going to need to use the new at onready decorator as opposed to just onready. So if we go at onready, bar animator, or whatever you want your variable to be called. We use a colon, we can set a data type, but that isn't necessary, but it does improve performance, so it's a worthwhile habit. We set the type of the animator to be an animation player. Equals dollar the path to it. So the only fundamental difference from Godot 3 here is the at before on ready. After we've got our animation player, we want to get the resume button and the quit button. They've got quite long paths though, so I'm going to use a slightly different approach. I'm going to use the find node method to get a hold of them. Find node just looks for a unique node with that name, so because my button's called resume button, it should only find that. Now we need our actual pause and unpause method. These are going to get called by those buttons, and they are going to play animations as well as set the pause mode for our whole game. So if I create unpause to start with, in here we want our animator to play our unpause function. So animator.play, and the name of our function, which is unpause with a capital U. Unpause. Then we want to actually set our game to be paused. We do that with getTree.pause. And we set it to be false. So what this will do is it will pause every node in our game that has its process mode set to inherit. So it's quite important now that we go to our root and we go down to the process mode, which is at the very bottom under node, everything inherits this. And we change our process mode to always. So now, even when everything else in the game gets paused, our actual pause menu will still be able to be used. Now the last step isn't necessary if you're in a 2D game, but I'm in a 3D FPS, so my mouse gets eaten when I'm using the game, and when I want to use a menu, I need to free that mouse. So I'm going to use input.setMouseMode to free it. And now we can make our pause function, which is going to be very similar. The pause function is going to call the pause animation instead. And instead of setting pause to false, it's going to set pause to true. And for me, or any people making an FPS, it's going to also set the mouse mode to be visible so that it's free to be used with the menu items. And now we get some of the lovely new Godot 4 features, which is the way connections work. I've discussed this in a previous video, and I really, really like it. But in our ready function, we can connect our play button and quit button so that their pressed signal will immediately call either unpause or pause as relevant. So our play button needs to unpause the game. So if we access our play button, get its pressed signal, and then call the connect method on that pressed signal, we can pass it a function that will be called when that signal is emitted. So we can pass unpause in there. And that's all we need. Now when the play button is pressed, unpause gets called. For our quit button, we want that to exit the game, which means we can pass it a global function to call whenever the button is pressed. So quit button dot pressed dot connect. And this time, instead of passing in our callable function, we're going to pass in the global get tree quit callable function. And now whenever the button is pressed, get tree dot quit gets called. And that's it for setting up that menu. We can now save this and add it to whatever scene we want to.
So I'm going to dive back into my player. I'm just going to add the pause menu under the player. If you use Control Shift A, you can add a script you've made by name. Mine's called pause menu. And now that pause menu is a child of my player script. If I hide all of this, it's right at the bottom here. What we want our player to do is whenever you press the escape button, it will call the pause function in the script. And the reason we do that in the player rather than in the pause menu is we want the check for when that button is pressed to be ignored when pause mode is true. So we go to our player, and we add an unhandled input event, and we want to check if the UI cancel event is pressed. So if event dot is action pressed, UI cancel. That's built in by default and it's hooked up to the escape key. Now we want to access our pause menu and we can call the pause function. And let's just try that out. So I've now run the game and if I hit the escape key, you can see all the edges blur and they dim and our pause menu comes in. Now the real question is, does clicking quit quit the game and does clicking resume resume the game? Hell yeah. And quit. Nice. So now we've got that all set up, one of the last nice things we can do is make it so that when you hit escape again when the game's already running, it will shut the menu. Uh, what we can do to trigger that is use a shortcut to make the escape key also click the button in the pause menu, but there are two steps necessary to get this working. At the moment, our menu will listen to inputs all the time. If we use our animation to make our pause menu invisible as well, then these buttons won't listen to inputs. So if we go to pause and we add visible to the animation player for when it pauses, and for unpause we make it invisible, now it won't listen to inputs anymore. And we can go over to our resume button and we can add a shortcut to trigger the resume button. Shortcuts down in base button, you get to add a new resource here, increase the array size by one, and add an input event action. The input event action is same as the one we used to open everything, UI cancel, and then check pressed so that this event will only trigger when UI cancel is pressed, so it doesn't emit when it's held down. And now if we run that, we should find if I hit escape once, if I hit escape again, the menu opens and closes. And that's really all there is to it.